Good morning, everyone. I'm Michael O'Hanlon with the Foreign Policy Program at Brookings, although you're just hearing my voice today. And uh, we're going to discuss an excellent new book by Melanie Sisson and Barry Blackman, as well as their colleague, James Siebens, done largely through the Stimson Center in Washington, where Barry Blackman formed the organization with his colleague, Michael Crapon, some uh, 35 years ago, after a distinguished career in government and at the Brookings Institution. At Brookings, one of Barry's signature accomplishments was a book that's still widely used today called Force Without War, in which he and colleagues examined a number of Cold War cases where the United States had threatened or in some way signaled the possibility of the use of force or otherwise employed military power, but without firing lethal ordnance to try to accomplish various kinds of foreign policy outcomes, whether in crisis, whether in an act of compellence to try to get another country to do something that it had not previously been doing, to reinforce deterrence when that seemed to be shaky, or for some other purpose that served American national security interests. In this recent study, looking at more than 100 cases since the Cold War ended, Melanie and Barry and Jeff have tried to, in many ways, update the analysis, but ask also, has the world changed? Has the way in which the United States uses military power shifted and should it shift? What does the evidence tell us about the most effective ways for the United States to use military power short of war? And again, one could think of all of this as under the general category of military coercion, hence the title of their outstanding book. So what we'll do today is talk through the study, its basic findings, its methodology, uh, its its strengths, uh, the limitations, not from the study itself, but from the data set, uh, which involves a, a number of cases, but about uh, eight or 10 countries that show up the most often. And so we'll have to ask to what extent are these eight or 10 indicative of future threats. But for American students of foreign policy and those around the world, the good news here, I suppose, is that the countries that are most heavily featured in this book are largely the ones the United States is still worried about today. So we'll get into this in just a moment in conversation, but I just wanna signal that Russia and China show up quite a bit, North Korea shows up a bit, a number of countries in the broader Middle East, and then Haiti, as well as the former Yugoslavia. So we'll talk through the cases, we'll talk through the results, and then we'll look forward to your questions that you can email uh, to Brookings, uh, events at brookings.edu, and I'll be able to see those even though you can't see me later in the conversation. So without further ado, we thought the best way to start this, and let me just say a brief additional word, uh, Melanie Sisson also is a Stimson Center uh, associate who has been a senior fellow there, had a number of other distinguished positions around Washington, and she and Barry together, uh, again, spearheaded this effort with the help of colleagues. And so we're really delighted to welcome uh, you both today. Barry, if I could begin with you and ask if you could just tell us a little bit more about the classic study, my word, not yours, I'm not asking you to, uh, to, to, to beat your own drum, but certainly what I consider one of the best Brookings security books of all time, Force Without War, what that taught us and why you wanted to update the analysis for the post-Cold War world. Over to you, my friend. Well, good morning again, and thank you, Michael. Um, Force of That War might not have been the best book ever written at Brookings, but it was probably the best seller. Um, it was done at uh, the result of a Defense Department contract, one that came from DARPA. It came at a time in the early mid-70s when the Defense Department, coming out of a losing war, was rethinking its role in the world, not only in war, its stock, military doctrine, and so forth, but what it did in peacetime, how it was deployed and how it supported foreign policy. And it asked us to take a look at these incidents. Now, remember, this was in the 1970s, uh, pre-internet. And so we uh, dove into what were then annual command histories from all the sinks. Uh, we looked at ship's logs to see where the aircraft carriers were um, during crises. And we just looked at a variety of primary published uh, sources, all unclassified, and discovered more than 200 uh, incidents, 
uh, involving the use of force going back to 1946, the end of the Second World War. And we then analyzed these incidents uh, statistically and also um, analyzed uh, a series of case studies which we had commissioned. And the book uh, caused quite a stir. It was received very well. It was one of the first to look at the military in this way, how the military is used short of uh, all out war in support of policy and support of the words, the threats, the demands of US policymakers. Um, and so it uh, became something of a classic um, it was adopted at graduate schools all over the country and by all the military colleges. And thus throughout um, the 80s and into well into the 90s, it was read by a generation of military officers as they went, uh, went through school and uh, was very well known at the time. Um, <clears throat> it then kind of faded from view. About uh, five years ago, maybe a little more, it was rediscovered by joint staff officers who were again looking at the role of the armed forces uh, coming out of what were not very successful campaigns in the Middle East this time. And uh, someone discovered uh, this book, Force Without War, and the officers would come up to Stimson to talk to me about it. They thought it was quite relevant to the problems they were facing. And uh, I agreed with them. It was a terrific analysis, of course. But um, I pointed out that it was about a different world. It was about the world of the Cold War. Many of many of the incidents involved the Soviet Union, if not directly, then indirectly. And the results naturally were skewed by the background of the risk of US-Soviet conflict uh, that was con a constant in those days. And so uh, they became persuaded that it was time to redo the study or not to redo the study, but to look at the same phenomena, this time using the modern tools that were now available not only information available on the internet, but a more modern and more rigorous statistical analysis. And uh, it turns out that um, the data on the internet was not that good. There's not uh, comprehensive systematic data on military activity available in an unclassified Form when the military went from doing their annual paper reports, <clears throat> excuse me, to reporting um, electronically, they kind of got sloppy and also started classifying many more things. And so we resorted to good old LexisNexis and many other standard tools to search and look for incidents in which the United States try to achieve a foreign policy objective utilizing the armed forces, but utilizing them in a way that was short of an all out uh, conflict. And we found uh, some interesting findings, some similar to those from the first uh, analysis. So the when I was talking about the comparison of the two, the, the current study is much more rigorous statistically than we were able to do. Um, it depends uh, less on official sources because military records, now that they're electronic, are more highly classified and not uh, recorded as uh, systematically as they had been back in the 70s when we were doing the original work at Brookings. Um, and thus depended on uh, James, our co-author, and uh, a coterie of interns and research assistants scouring open sources for incidents in which the United States attempted to achieve 
a foreign policy objective utilizing the armed forces, but in a way which would not lead to an all out conflict. And with that, I'll turn to Melanie to describe the contemporary analysis. Barry, thank you. And I will pass off the baton to Melanie in just a second. But uh, first, I also wanted to not only congratulate you uh, on picking up this important methodology and thanking you for doing so, but also just to tease out a couple of the interesting findings that we'll get to after we talk about methodology and the approach you took and that Melanie will discuss. But I just want to let folks know, for example, on page 37 of the book, you see some of the interesting findings, one of which is the United States has had a 92% success rate in using some form of military coercion to maintain the territorial integrity of its allies. And that's a pretty high number. On the low end, we've had only a 17% success rate in attempting to change regimes with these limited again, non-lethal, non-invasion kinds of uses of force. So again, the, the scope of the book is not about the invasion of Iraq or Afghanistan as much as it is more limited approaches to trying to achieve outcomes short of the use of force. But I think I should now turn to Melanie to uh, again, explain the methodology from the ground up, please. Uh, you know, what kind of cases were you looking at? How did you go about coding the cases, so to speak? And, and then we'll get to the findings here in a few minutes. Over to you, Melanie, and thank you again for joining us. Great, thank you, Mike. Um, thanks to you and Adam and the whole Brookings team for having us. Um, I know I'll, I'm, I feel comfortable saying on Barry's behalf that we're both delighted to be here and have been looking forward to this conversation very much. So thanks. And thanks to you, Mike, for being a really um, thoughtful and sensitive reader of the book. We've had the opportunity to talk before. Um, and you know, I've always appreciated your um, sometimes probative, but always interesting and built in with curiosity questions. So I'm looking forward to continuing that here. I do want to pick up a little bit on orienting into the study, what it is that we were looking at specifically, things we were not looking at specifically, and how we went about the business of putting it all together. Um, so, so first, just a, a statement of the purpose of why we would do this. As Barry mentioned, others in the community identified a need for thinking about this particular form of foreign policy behavior. Um, Barry rightly agreed that this is important for the coming decades, potentially century. Um, we so, see no reason why the phenomenon of interest here, which is the use of the military to pursue foreign policy objectives, um, will significantly decrease over time. So the purpose in writing the book was to acknowledge that fact and to try to find ways that say, if the United States is going to continue to use the armed services in this way, which is costly and risky in some cases, we'd like to see if we can find information that will help decision makers and leaders know how to do that better, right? Um, so we went about trying to figure out how to learn how US, the United States could use the military instrument to coerce uh, more effectively into the future. Um, and I sort of highlight the word coerce specifically because I wanna make sure that we're defining that construct clearly. Um, coercion in the context of this study is the use of the armed forces to shape the behaviors of another actor, right? So military coercion does not impose an outcome. It shapes the choices that are available to an adversary, right? So it changes the cost benefit calculation. Um, now that can be done, I think you mentioned before Mike, through uh, we usually refer to deterrence and compellence um, and, and those are primary modes of military coercion in the study. Um, I, I, I will point out that uh, I think coercion has a, carries a negative connotation in some cases. And just in my personal opinion, in the realm of international politics, I don't think that it should, right? Um, I think coercion is not a dirty word. It's not something that only bad guys do. I think it is a simple fact of international political life. And so it behooves us to treat it that way, which is I think um, why in part this book is, is timely. Um, so that's military coercion. Um, the other thing I want to make sure that we define is this short of war clause that you see in the title. 
Um, if military coercion doesn't impose an outcome, right, um, that doesn't mean it isn't a firm application of force in some cases. So short of war does not mean actually that we don't use kinetic activity in military coercion. In fact, we do. There are 21 instances in the data set in which the United States used kinetic action to shape the behaviors of other actors in military um, coercive efforts. Um, the final sort of de definitional element I want to be sure to be clear about is the time period. When we refer in, as shorthand to the post-Cold War era, we're looking specifically at the time box between January 1991 and June 2018. Um, and so I'll refer to that as the post-Cold War era. That is, that is the, the time period during which all of our cases um, occurred. So anything prior or post is outside of our scope. That doesn't mean we can't you know, use our brains and think about them, but I wanna be clear that we won't have researched and studied them to the extent um, that we have the cases that are in the study. Um, one other uh, quick note, Barry, I appreciate mentioning our um, group of interns and leadership of James Stevens in the data collection. And I certainly uh, want to make sure that we acknowledge um, interns often are the unsung heroes of our business, as you well know, Mike, uh, and they deserve great credit. And James deserves great credit for um, his diligence and their diligence in creating the data set uh, that was so rich and usable for the statistical analyses. Okay. So um, the other thing to make clear um, is what we don't do in this study. So we wanna take a couple of things off the table. Um, the first is because we're looking at short of war uh, incidents, anything to do with the war on terror is outside of our scope. We don't address any incidents that fall under the umbrella of the war on terror. Um, I mentioned that we do look at cases of deterrence uh, as part of military coercion. I want to be very clear, though, that those cases are specific in what you might consider immediate cases of deterrence. We do not look at general deterrence. And by that, what I mean is the area of our interest here was not to examine uh, the ways in which or whether, how, when, why, and to what end the United States uses its military to prevent challenges to U.S. interests from arising in the first place, right? So this notion of general deterrence, of preventing wars, of uh, forestalling fait accompli and other sorts of activities uh, that are deemed inconsistent with U.S. interests, those are not our focus here. Um, so our focus instead actually is only when general deterrence has failed, right? When a challenge to US interest has arisen and even more that the United States has chosen to respond with the military, right? So what I'm, I'm talking about broadly is our inclusion criteria, right? So we have time period. Um, we've identified that a challenge has arisen. We've identified that US policymakers have decided to invoke the armed forces in some way, shape or form. Um, the other criteria that we applied are that there's a clear target. So we're bringing the military out to do something in relation to an identified actor. And finally, for a stated policy objective, for a purpose, right? Um, and for that policy objective, we rely very much on the statements of US um, political and military leadership. So um, we take what our leaders tell us is the purpose of these military activities at face value. We don't interpret, we don't judge, we don't assess, we just code them, right? And again, James and the team was very diligent about doing that with fidelity. Um, so, uh, you, this is a very uh, set bounded universe of cases for examination, which makes us sure that we're actually studying the phenomenon of interest, which is military coercion and not something else. Um, in terms of those policy objectives, uh, as I just mentioned, we need them to be identified and we take them at face value from political leadership. Uh, another point of clarification in how we scope the study is to say the kinds of policy objectives we are interested in are not the big line of effort sort of strategic objectives, so to speak, which is to say, we're not interested in whether or not the United States achieved democratization in Haiti, right? We're not interested in looking at whether or not it was successful in denuclearizing any state um, or normalization of all state behaviors, right? What we are looking at, and Michael, you teased this a little, um, are very specific, discrete um, behaviors on the part of the actor the United States is trying to coerce, right? So not to revise territory, right? Um, to stop or refrain from acquiring or transiting conventional weapons, to stop or refrain from harming civilians. We have a set of eight very specific demands that the United States levied against the set of overall 14 uh, countries 
um, that it targeted through military coercion during this time period. Um, so those are the those are the outcomes of interest, specifically whether or not those states complied with U.S. demands. Um, so I might, since it's since we're not in person, I feel like I should pause and Michael and see if you have any questions up to that point or if any questions are relevant to that point uh, before going into sort of specifying some of the findings here. Yeah, thank you, Melanie. That's fantastic, and I do think it's a good moment to give a couple of examples to clarify the scope, uh, since I think I may have slightly misled. In, in suggesting that categorically there's never any case that involves the use of force. Your point, just to clarify, is that if we do use force, it's not necessarily, or it's, it's categorically not an invasion kind of situation where we impose an outcome militarily. It's a case where the adversary has to make a choice. That's what really distinguishes the cases from those that might involve all out war, if I'm understanding correctly. And so for example, with the Kosovo War of 1999, uh, as I understand things, you do include that because our goal there was never to directly overthrow Slobodan Milosevic uh, or even to control the territory of Kosovo with our own boots on the ground. It was to create enough coercive pressure through the use of actual live ordinance that Milosevic would make a decision to pull out of Kosovo. Now, is, is that a correct interpretation on my part? That's exactly right. And then another case, and then, and then we can come back to methodology and talking more through the study. With Iraq, in 1991, when we launched Operation uh, Desert Storm, that's not in your database because Desert Storm was not giving Saddam Hussein the choice about whether he kept forces in Kuwait. We were going to drive him out regardless of his preference. And so it became a technical military challenge as opposed to an exercise in coercion. However, other things that we tried to do over the years with Saddam Hussein uh, comply with the terms of the ceasefire resolutions or UN Security Council resolutions on weapons of mass destruction activities, those require a choice by him. And so even if they did use some force, for example, Operation Desert Fox mm -hmm. in 1998, when we bombed for four days, that would be included in the database. Is that also correct? Yes, precisely. Great, great. So now what I wanted well, Mike, to- Mike, uh, one interesting thing on the Iraq example is we did try to coerce him before actually invading Kuwait. We tried to coerce him by, uh, build, by the buildup on the Gulf and by the threats and then by the air war. And none of that was sufficient to get him to withdraw his forces from Kuwait. In the end, we had to go to war uh, for it. Thank you, very good clarification. Uh, Melanie, I'll let you pick up where you left off, but I also wanted to make sure that you discussed, or you know, I'm sure you will, the kinds of tools that we're talking about here, um, you know, just so people know what kinds of instruments of compellence or deterrence or coercion we're using. We just mentioned a few, Barry just mentioned a few military deployments, uh, no fly zones, et cetera. But I wondered if you could just give us a quick list of the different kinds of instruments that are in, involved here in your data set. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Mike. Um, so certainly we covered the array of the military instruments that were actually applied. So we basically looked at each of the cases that we identified through research. Um, we started in terms of identification of those cases using some scholarly sources of militarized interstate disputes. And then we researched a lot around them, did peer research, I think, as Barry mentioned, through you know, LexisNexis and other sort of um, resources like that to make sure we're identifying as much as we can. Um, and we take from that research a description of the military activity that was involved. Was it a no-fly zone? Was it a blockade? Did we send a, a carrier strike group? Um, did we, what kind of planes did we send? How many troops were deployed? Um, the full nature and scope of the military activity itself. I think it's also important, however, Mike, um, to, to highlight that the other elements of coercion um, that are available and were used by the United States during these incidents also were captured in our data set. We wanted to make sure we're capturing um, the context and the ways in which these tools um, are or are not used together and what kinds of interactive effects those might have. So for example, high level diplomatic talks, sanctions, economic sanctions. Um, we've looked at whether or not the general statements across the apparatus of the US government were consistent or inconsistent, right? 
Um, so while we were um, comprehensive in terms of capturing the military tools that were used, we also wanted to make sure that we captured these other assets at US disposal as well. And those also are in the, the data set. Um, uh, so uh, I'll pause again and see if you wanted to follow up on that or if we shall go into some of the findings. Yeah, I think this is a good time to go ahead and move into the findings, especially because I don't want to dominate this. And there are a lot of questions coming in. So you folks have definitely engendered some curiosity and interest. So why don't I let you finish up with the overview of the findings and then we'll get to some of the audience questions. Over. That's perfect, perfect, thanks. So um, in terms of findings, what I thought I would do is just sort of give a sample of some of the very specific and I think policy relevant guidelines that come out of, of the study. Um, and then I wanna give some, a little bit of a big picture takeaway in, in terms of the importance that we hope that this study um, provides in terms of carry forward action, how it can inform actual decisions in the real world as we proceed. So um, uh, we've talked a bit about having done statistical analyses um, and we were very fortunate. I, I cannot claim to have done those uh, sophisticated statistical analyses myself. We were really fortunate to work with two excellent scholars from the University of Maryland, Jacob Aronson and Paul Huth. Um, very well known in the field um, and uh, really great colleagues to work with. So um, we were privileged to hand over this um, uh, co complete data set to them for them to work on. And one of the things I'll highlight um, is that uh, through no fault of Barry's own, but rather based on the resources available at the time, the prior study uh, found some very important correlations. The statistical modeling that Jacob and Paul did here are causal, right? So we are teasing out the independent effects of these different influences on the outcomes of coercive exchanges. So we look at things like statistical significance to say, you know, that definitively has an independent causal effect on the likelihood that the targeted actor will comply with US demands. So um, we break down the results in three general categories. So the first is people are probably primarily interested in, well, what increases the likelihood that US military coercion will achieve? What tools, what instruments, what contexts here have an independent and positive effect on the outcome? So the first, and I think uh, very important because it is robust and durable across many different iterations of the modeling and testing um, in, in the data set is the fact that um, flowing forces from outside the area in which a conflict of interest is occurring into that area increases significantly the likelihood of coercive success, right? So again, the flowing of forces from outside in increases the likelihood of success, and that is holding all other variables constant, okay? So independently, that act alone uh, is a net positive for coercive efforts. Um, the other note I will say about that, in, uh, in addition to being robust across the different sorts of testing, is that that result holds no matter the composition of the forces the United States is deploying. So it is not as though we are locked into a particular movement of a particular asset to achieve this effect. There's a lot of flexibility because it is the fact of the movement, not the nature of what is being moved, um, which I think is really a, a surprising finding. Um, other uh, uh, elements of context or of activity that increase the likelihood of success is making highly specific demands. When the United States made specific demands of the targeted actors, the likelihood of success was higher as compared to when it made non-specific demands. Um, this is probably fairly intuitive and understandable. Contextually, the kinds of things we looked at, for example, were is the US government unified or divided across uh, you know, the White House and Congress? Um, and it turns out a divided US government, when we have a divided US government, coercive efforts have a higher likelihood of succeeding, right? So some samples of the positives there. Um, there are also are characteristics that decrease the likelihood that the target will comply with um, US demands. Um, Pre-existing sanctions and adding sanctions after initiation of military coercion both had a significantly negative effect on the likelihood that the military action would succeed in uh, convincing the targeted actor to comply with United States demands. Right. Um, this finding is uh, was to me at least somewhat surprising um, and runs counter to a lot of current policy. Um, and so therefore I think um, merits some additional attention and some additional thinking. It was, it was not something that had I written down my predictions ahead of time that I necessarily would thought would fall out of the data analyses, which is a 
good reminder to always be humble when we're working with data. Um, other uh, characteristics that decrease the likelihood of target compliance is general public threats. So whereas highly specific demands increase the likelihood, um, vague public threats um, decreased the likelihood that the targeted actor would comply with US demands. And another contextual one that is particularly um, apropos, I suppose, is that um, the United States has a lower likelihood of succeeding in military coercion during presidential election years. Um, finally, the third category is that there are some characteristics that do, don't have an identifiable effect, either positive or negative. There's no, no significant effect um, when they're present as compared to when they are not. Um, the, the, another one that I think is uh, surprising um, that should catch some attention is that the size of pre-existing U.S. presence in the region where the conflict of interest arises has no effect on the likelihood um, that the target will comply with U.S. demands. It, it's not a positive, it doesn't increase, it doesn't decrease the likelihood of success, it just has no effect. And I'll say again, flowing forces from outside in, which does have a positive effect on the likelihood of achieving success, that holds whether the size of the pre-existing presence is great or small, right? So those two findings together, I think, are a point of particular interest for me when I, when I consider what I've learned from the study. Um, we have also learned from the study that high-level diplomatic talks don't seem to have any independent effect on the likelihood of US success. Um, and it turns out that neither does US kinetic action. So it is not the case that bombing increases the likelihood um, that a target will comply with US demands. Now, there are some reasons that that might be true. And so I don't wanna overstate um, one could consider, for example, uh, that, that if a conflict has escalated to the point where kinetic action is involved anyway, you have two very resolved actors. Um, and so the contest is harder uh, to arbitrate in that sense. So. Um, that's a lot of rapid fire sort of direct findings. Um, and I think, again, I'll take a pause. Michael, you can tell me whether to proceed to the general lessons or if you want to have a moment here. Well, I th thank you. That's fantastic. I thought I, maybe we should also ask Barry if he wants to reinforce one or two of the most striking findings that, uh, that would perhaps be the most important to take away, either because they're counterintuitive uh, or they're different from this database relative to his earlier study in the Cold War, or just because they're so compelling that they're so fundamentally reinforced by the data that they're really almost uh, beyond the point of working hypotheses or provisional results, and they seem pretty robust. Barry, any comments on any of those issues? Yes, I'd, I'd highlight uh, um, Melanie's uh, final point. Uh, about the irrelevance really of the size of US forces in the theater of conflict or the area of crisis prior to the incident. This is germane to the current debate about whether the US and should station uh, forces overseas on a permanent basis in Europe uh, or in East Asia for that matter, or rather turn more to the kind of mobile temporary deployments that we've been doing uh, more and more in recent years. Uh, our findings would suggest that when you have a permanent presence, even if it's a quite substantial one, um, and then a crisis emerges, the presence is a given. It's a, a part of the background in which the adversary uh, is cognizant and the adversary has chosen to challenge a U.S. interest despite that presence. But when you move forces into a region for a temporary exercise or whatever the reason, it has the advantage of getting his or her attention and saying, oh, look, the U.S. is serious. It is now putting more at stake. It is showing a willingness to make a deeper commitment. And that seems to have much more of an effect than the fact that we had kept 40,000 troops or whatever in that region for the past several decades. So it's very relevant to the debate about troops in Germany, troops in South Korea, and current questions that will face the next administration. Thank you.
So Melanie, over to you for the final piece of this overview, and then we'll get to some of the questions from the audience. Great, thanks. Yeah, and to pick up on Barry's you know, very apt uh, comment there is, uh, the big takeaway, I think, is to remember that military coercion is communication. So Barry just mentioned, you know, that the flow of forces from outside end is, is sending a message, right? It is, it is distinguishing itself from the extant presence already in region. And the shorthand that we've applied from that is, is that, you know, military coercion really is an attempt to differentiate signal from noise. Right. We need to be using the military to send a message directly and as clearly as possible about what it is the United States expects from the adversary. What are the demands on its behaviors? And so the sort of key takeaways and concepts and constructs, and, and I want to I note that these sort of general um, findings or learnings that come out of the study emerge not just from the statistical analyses, but from the really well done in depth case studies that we benefited greatly from. We had an excellent roster of scholars and experts contribute um, their thinking to this project. Um, and uh, the study would clearly be half of what it is in the absence of, of their insights. And so I'm drawing on both of those elements, the statistical modeling to sort of reveal some patterns in causation in conjunction with the thinking and theory and understanding and interpretation that's embedded in those really rich case studies. So um, again, the, the thing I would just stomp my foot about when we think about military coercion is that it is communication. It is a form of communication and we need to remember that and treat it as such, right? Um, and what are we communicating then is the question and how do we do it successfully? We saw some of the hows, right? And I can encapsulate those in a couple um, bullet points, if you will. Some of them are very old and familiar sort of tropes at this point. So for example, we should remember Sun Tzu. We need to know ourselves and we need to know the adversary, right? So we need to understand in the US how, what our priorities are and how much we care about a particular conflict of interest. How much cost is the United States ready to absorb itself? How resolved is it in the form of being willing to absorb cost, right? How resolved is it um, and how much is it willing to accept as we proceed out to embark upon this military coercion? We also need to understand the target not just our ability to hurt the target, right? And not just our willingness to hurt the target, but we need to understand what the target values, what motivates the target. The target gets to decide what is painful for them. We don't get to decide that, right? We ought to know, we ought to learn, we ought to use all of our interagency tools, our intelligence community, our scholarship. We've got all of these resources in the United States. We need to understand and have a, a colleague of mine likes to call it empathy for the adversary in the sense of being able to understand what they care about so we can target our actions, our imposition of cost appropriately. Um, we need, because it is communication again, to be specific. It is much harder for a target to comply with our demands if they are confused as to what those are. If they don't know what behaviors the United States is looking for, it's much harder for them to achieve it. They may not be trying you know, to, to uh, misbehave uh, or to you know, uh, disagree or um, can't find the right word for it. They're not trying, to, they may want to do the right thing in terms of what the United States is asking it for, but they can't, they can't understand what that is. So being specific with our demands and with our threats um, is important. Finally, I think we have to remember that um, the world is a manifold and complex place and we cannot wish away context, right? We cannot presume that factors outside of our control um, do have an effect on the outcome of these coercive exchanges. And so what that means is as decision makers are uh, considering using the armed forces for military coercion, they need to be sensitive to and aware of those contextual factors that either help or hurt, right? So we should know our sanctions in place. Is it a presidential election year, right? We may not be able to control either of those in the immediate sense, but we should understand going in what they might mean about the likelihood of success um, in a coercive exchange. Um, so those are the, the sort of big takeaway lessons that, that I've drawn from the study. Um, and I'll again, stop there and see if Barry, if you have any others you'd like to add um, or Mike, if we're ready to move into questions. I might just add one, one thing uh, uh, that, Oh, Melanie hasn't brought out yet, which is the uh, choices available to U.S. decision makers on which forces to move into the region when we want to coerce someone. You know, we have 11 aircraft carriers and we often think, oh, we'll have to send a carrier, but they're so limited in number. Well, in addition, 
we have, I think it's seven uh, amphibious carriers. These are the same size as the carriers the Chinese are, are building, but we don't call them aircraft carriers. But we found in our study that moving an amphibious ready group into a region had just as much effect as moving an aircraft carrier into that region, which means that decision makers have a much wider choice of resources and perhaps we're not so constrained or not as constrained as um, the armed forces often portray, portray us. There you are. <laughs> You're very kind. Uh, so I will, I'm now on my phone, and, but I've managed to read most of the questions in the chat function when I was still on the computer. So let me begin with some of those. One question had to do with whether the world has changed so much since the Cold War uh, that we really should think of these two studies as apples and oranges. Of course, this is a more academic question because we're still in the, the post-Cold War world and your study was about the post-Cold War world. So even if, even if these are apples and oranges, it doesn't affect the relevance of your study going forward. But the question had to do with whether in the Cold War we had fairly clear spheres of influence, if you will, whereas in the post-Cold War world, a lot, of the, uh, a lot of the effort has been to try to create new rules of the road, new places of American influence, maybe not in Korea, for example, but certainly in the Baltic states or in parts of the Middle East. And so to what extent are we talking about fundamentally different kinds of problems, you know, trying to use coercion for American foreign policy purposes during the Cold War versus post-Cold War? Well, so Barry, do you wanna go first? Uh, sure. Um, you make a very good point. Um, and not only are the, the two international environments very different, uh, but the two studies are very different. As, as uh, Melanie pointed out, in the first study, we were only able to correlate uh, factors with success. We did, weren't able to isolate causes, determinants, of success. Our statistical methods were uh, frankly primitive and uh, we only looked at a sample of cases. Yeah. In the later study, Melanie and our colleagues at the University of Maryland were able to, de to determine causality, which is a very different thing, and were able to look comprehensively at all the cases. So it's a much more sophisticated study, I would say. Um, the phenomena we're looking at are the same, and the phenomena are very important in the world we live in now. Uh, but I think the two studies are very different. And, you know, I wouldn't, there are differences in findings, and I wouldn't be concerned about those. Uh, but the concept underlying them are, is similar, but is the same. And uh, the, perhaps that's the important thing to emphasize that the armed forces um, not only can be used in conflict to achieve ends directly, but can be used to persuade others to achieve our ends for us without actually going to all out war. Yeah, I, absolutely, I agree entirely. And I think that the thing I will just emphasize is that our definition of coercion, um, the phenomenon that we're interested in is derived directly from the original study. So um, I think they, while, while they may be different varietals of apples, I don't think it's an apples to oranges situation uh, because there is that direct conceptual line. One more question concerned the degree to which the new kinds of gray area warfare uh, that we could undertake, or maybe more to the point that adversaries might conduct either against us or our allies, is somehow captured within your framework. Cyber attack, terrorism, other kinds of non-traditional, non-Cold War kinds of aggression or uh, use of violence or even electrons to try to achieve an outcome. Do you feel like your findings are relevant as we try to understand how American national security policy can affect the likelihood that foreign actors will use those kinds of tactics and techniques and technologies against us or our allies. Yeah, what I would say to that is that the question mark is more around whether or not coercion is the right way to approach those exchanges in the first place. 
right? So there is nothing inherent about any of those behaviors that um, I can automatically say, well, you know, no coercive effort on the part of the United States should ever be employed or it will work or it won't work, right? But those, that question mark has to be asked and the answer has to be assessed against the nature of the exchange itself. I don't see any reason behaviorally you could say we, we can't coerce a change in cyber behavior. In fact, um, although we didn't study you know, the cyber realm uh, for, for this uh, particular work, we talk a lot about cyber deterrence, right? So those concepts are still applicable even in these, as you say, sort of gray areas. The real question is about what is the right response for the United States based on what it wants to achieve? Um, and if the military can be useful in that or not. Another question concerns whether there is any particular case from the last 27 years or the last 30 in which you think it's especially compelling that the way we might have approached a problem was not useful and we should have used uh, something short of war. I, I'm not sure if this is sort of a veiled way of talking about the Iraq and Afghanistan invasions or a more general question, but to what extent would you look at a particular crisis and sort of imagine replaying that crisis with whatever tools you think might have been more optimal for handling it than the ones we actually employed? So is there a, a case or two or three that jump out at you as ones where if you could go back armed with the knowledge that you've now got from your study and have the United States replay that crisis response or that act of coercion, that it's particularly, uh, you know, uh, particularly uh, logical to you that we should have done something other than what we did. I might jump in and uh, talk about um, our attempts to coerce Milosevic to um, end the war to come to Dayton and end the war. We did just about everything wrong for several years. And as a consequence of that, thousands of people lost their lives in the former Yugoslavia. We were divided uh, at home. Uh, the president was determined that we would not have casualties. We were divided among allies and we were sending mixed messages as Melanie had said, being clear about your objective is essential. And when we finally took military action, we were very, very timid. Uh, we, as we said, we use kinetic activity, bombing, but we tried to avoid getting at anything essential. So first we bombed um, air defense batteries, and then we bombed other military targets. And Milosevic kind of laughed that off. He said, oh, they're not serious. They're not serious. And it was only when we began finally to bomb things that he cared about, and this highlights the importance of understanding the target, the individual target's uh, values. When we began to bomb things he valued in Belgrade and things valued by the cohorts that supported him, was he willing to concede uh, to our objective? So I think that's a very interesting case. It was a very costly case uh, for many people. Melanie, Melanie, would you like to add anything to that another answer? Example? No, I think that's perfectly put. Okay, great. We have a question about, and Barry, you got at this a little bit, but there was a specific question about aircraft carriers, and maybe it also has uh, you know, utility as a more general kind of question. To what extent can we take the findings of your study and draw broader lessons and guides about future American military force planning, budgeting, resource allocation, modernization? Because the question is, does this study bolster the argument for continuing to fund and build aircraft carriers, since there are other questions about their future utility and survivability. And now you've apparently shown that whether it's a carrier or an amphibious ship or a battalion of ground forces or you know, a squadron of fighter jets based on land, it may not matter that much which of those things we send if we're trying to achieve a given outcome. So does this study sort of argue against aircraft carriers writ large? So 
I would not say that it argues against aircraft carriers writ large. What I would say is what Barry had said earlier. What it really argues for is some um, flexible minds, right? We have flexibility in the tools that we can apply and the force packages and the force design. Um, and so we hope that this work can feed into those conversations. I think that overdrawing, uh, you know, um, balls and strikes based on this would be misguided. I do hope, however, that it generates precisely this kind of conversation, which is, okay, so how do we think about the four structures that we need? What is it that we need the military to achieve? What tools do we have? How can we align them? Do we need to overweight in any one direction or is a more balanced set of investments merited, right? This, I hope this book can contribute to that kind of process. Excellent. There's a question about sanctions more generally. And again, maybe this is sort of in the, in the same broad category of the previous question, trying to think of what we can deduce about a, a whole type of instrument of American foreign policy from your specific study. And it's about sanctions and whether in effect you are arguing uh, you know, more categorically against the use of sanctions in you know, US foreign policy writ large, or are your conclusions more specific to the situation where sanctions are combined with military coercion to try to achieve a specific outcome at a specific moment in time? Yeah, that's a really important and relevant question. I appreciate that. And the latter fashioning is, is the answer, Mike. So we didn't study sanctions, right, specifically. We did not examine whether sanctions as sanctions um, are an effective tool of policy. What we examined were these specific circumstances in which the military was invoked in conjunction with sanctions that were in place either before and or imposed after, right? So this is not any kind of blanket statement about sanctions. I do think it is important to note, however, the, uh, the, the interaction between these two tools used and how they're used in sequence um, and how that affects the likelihood of success. And I, I'll ask Barry maybe to, to add that last layer of the why. Why would this sequencing, why would this mutuality of use decrease the likelihood of success in achieving those military coercive goals? Yeah, say, um, well, first I should say there have been studies showing that sanctions are relatively ineffective means of achieving foreign policy goals. Studies done across the street from Brookings at the International Institute for Economics. Um, but more generally, sanctions have become a kind of a default uh, policy lever for US decision makers, where we don't really want to get too deeply involved. We don't want to put lives at risk. Uh, we're tied up in the Middle East, for example. And so we'll say, oh, we'll put some sanctions on them. And it's often interpreted, I think, uh, particularly when the sanctions come after the military threat has been made, it's interpreted as a sign of weakness. Well, the Americans don't want to go to war or they're not willing to go to war over this. So they're putting sanctions on us and there's ways around sanctions and it's, but it's interpreted as a, a sign of weakness uh, quite often, I think. That's not to say they can't work in particular circumstances and they don't achieve some goals, uh, but they become uh, too automatic a response, I'd say, in, uh, in recent years. We've got a few more minutes left and a couple more questions, but I wanted to also give you both a chance, since we've been talking about some failures or some problems, whether it's the Balkans in the 1990s or combining sanctions with uh, military coercion. I wanted to ask if there were any striking examples of success of places where when you looked through the data, studied the cases, saw the statistical outcomes and also the detailed case study outcomes, if there were, even though you've both been following American foreign policy for a long time and therefore probably weren't surprised by too many of the big picture outcomes, whether there were certain specific findings that uh, were examples of successful practice that we should perhaps try to employ more frequently, more habitually in US national security policy. 
Yeah, thanks. I think that's important. It's a nice, and I'm glad we got here because, you know, one of the things I want to emphasize about the book is that this is something the United States can do well, right? We can use the military effectively, right? Um, and so one of those cases that stands out to me is the 1999 Taiwan Straits confrontation. And the things that I look at about success, um, in that case, it was, you know, um, the Taiwan leadership had made some statements that ran counter to the one China policy. China reacted predictably and did some military exercises and some missiles were fired. Um, and the United States uh, became involved. Um, and what I'm looking at is the process for the way in which the United States responded. So um, basically it was a really um, cohesive communicative response. We had um, government officials uh, across departments saying the same and consistent message. Um, there had been a visit, a diplomatic visit scheduled to Taiwan that was uh, canceled, but with the right language around, you know, not um, needing to, to escalate unnecessarily given the circumstances. At the same time, the United States increased its arms sales to Taiwan and moved two carrier groups into the vicinity, into the surrounding seas, right? But postured them in such a place that they weren't threatening, they were just known to be there. Right. So it was a very cohesive, comprehensive use of the military in conjunction with these other other elements of US influence. So that's what was striking to me. Barry, any additional comments that you would like to add? Well, I think um, I would just reemphasize what Melanie said already, the importance of, well, one, understanding uh, the adversary or the target's uh, values. What is it he or she are, are really after? And secondly, uh, providing a consistent uh, message across government agencies, across officials, which uh, get at that specific uh, value, which make clear that we understand what's at stake and that we're willing to uh, go to the mat for it. And that's uh, more important than the, the 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 details of how the forces are moved or which forces are moved. There is one last set of questions from the audience, and then I want to finish up. We'll go a couple of minutes late here since we started late due to my technical issues. Uh, I want to finish up by asking you both about Russia and China today since the national defense strategy has elevated great power competition to the very top tier of national security policy. And I realize your study may only speak to certain dimensions of the US-Russia and US-China relationships, but given the importance of those, I wanna see if we can finish up by asking if you have any further insights. But before I get to that, let me capture the last two questions from the audience. And they both have to do with American internal cohesion and politics. One of them sounds more specific to the Trump era and the other is more general. So the general one, you say in the study that we somehow seem to do better when we have divided government. Is that really a robust finding? And if so, how do you explain it? And then we, we, I think you touched on this earlier, Melanie, but maybe a little bit more detail. And then second, at a time when, you know, as today, we have such intense strife in our politics. Are there any lessons that you would leave policymakers with, uh, you know, in these next few months of a difficult presidential election year? And then, you know, as we move towards a new presidential term, whether it's President Trump, Pre uh, Vice President Biden, who is elected, any lessons for that period as well? Over to you both on those questions about internal cohesion and uh, divided government. Sure. Why don't I tackle divided government and uh, and then Barry, you can you can follow on with the second question there. So the the finding is robust, yes, and it actually echoes other scholarship um, in the in the field as well. Um, and the the reason for that is that it is actually a sign of commitment and resolve, right? If you can get these two fractious parties to agree on the importance of this military coercive effort. Um, it carries some indicator of, I think, the resolve that's, that's being communicated to the adversary, right? Um, so that can cut both ways, of course, right? Um, insofar as they might think that, uh, the adversary might think that it's less likely that the president will get approval for any particular action, but that in fact is what makes it more compelling when there is that cohesion around a foreign policy action from a divided government, right? 
Barry, any thoughts on the current moment in U.S.? Well, it's a dangerous period we're entering, I think. It's a, a time where adversaries might think they could take advantage of the divided government, the divided population in the United States, uh, where they might think it would be difficult for the U.S. to act. So we're entering a period that's fraught with danger. And I think it's essential that uh, both branches uh, reaffirm when, when necessary our current commitments and our willingness to stand up for them and to make clear that uh, our political differences notwithstanding, uh, we're willing to continue to support our, our commitments and our allies. And now to pick up on that last point and then conclude with the specific lessons you might offer for dealing with Russia and China going forward. And I realize we've already touched on a number of aspects already. So maybe you just want to reiterate and summarize any key points. A, a lot of cases in your book do pertain to Russia in the 2014 time period after the invasion and annexation of Crimea and the Russian supported aggression in Eastern Ukraine. So you've got a lot of material to work with there, a lot of things you looked, looked at in regard to those cases. Melanie, you just spoke about Taiwan Strait crises from the late 1990s, and there are other cases regarding China as well. Any further final thoughts you two might wanna add on those questions of Russia and China, or while you, you've got the podium, any other concluding remarks? Over to you, please. Sure, thanks, Mike. Um, yeah, I think, um, you know, the, the general lessons of the study are broadly applicable across different actors, different states. I will, I will just say that one of the things I worry about as we move ahead um, over the coming decades is, uh, you know, as I said before, coercion is communication. It requires understanding of the adversary and it, and it requires that the adversary understand us and what we're signaling as well. You know, in the Cold War, we had a really dense network, a communicative network of treaties and exchanges and talks and communities, right? Um, we've never had those with China and they've been dismantled. The ones that we've had have been dismantled with Russia. And I think that what that means is that um, it makes the quality of our signals precarious. We don't have a good understanding of how China will interpret military moves. We don't have a good understanding um, of, of necessarily what they're doing with their military and why and what they value. And so it degrades our ability to communicate carefully and increases the risk of miscommunication, misperception and inadvertent escalation. Something I know Mike that you've thought a lot about um, in, in particular in that region. And that worries me. Um, and so in addition to the specific lessons from this book, the general lesson, my hope is that moving forward, we can approach our understanding of China and Russia a bit differently than we have in, in the recent past um, and uh, figure out ways to minimize the likelihood that um, otherwise uh, minimal exchanges can escalate well beyond their intended uh, scope. I certainly uh, second uh, that recommend those recommendations about rebuilding uh, communications channels and uh, understandings, mutual understandings about behavior. In the case of Russia, I think it's essential that whether it's a reelected Trump administration or a democratic administration, that we reaffirm, rebuild, strengthen our commitment to NATO and make clear to Russia that we are as committed to the members of NATO uh, now as, as we ever have been. And uh, we can make, uh, we can do that diplomatically and verbally, but in addition, we can do it through um, a continuation of the exercises we've started in terms of temporary deployments of land-based aircraft and ground forces to work with the allies in Eastern Europe uh, to develop familiarity and so forth. We don't need to base uh, substantial numbers of forces in Poland or in other East European countries, but uh, a series of exercises to make clear of our commitment uh, would be um, very helpful. 
The case of China, I think, is more difficult because our commitments are not as clear there. The commitment to Taiwan is very clear, but the Chinese have been pushing, as you know, in the East China Sea and the South China Sea, make staking claims, and our response has been um, ambiguous at best. And there, that will take some thought as to what, what to do and how to do it and to try to reach some understanding and to try to build what we've never had with China, as Melanie pointed out, some series of uh, communications channels and understandings about our respective interests and our respective willingness to tolerate uh, the other's behavior in that region. Thank you. I wanna thank you both very much. I also wanna put in a final plug for the book, Military Coercion and US Foreign Policy. I'm not sure if this is inverted through uh, the technology, mm -hmm. but, but in any event, it's an excellent and very readable book of about 200 pages. In addition to three or four main chapters by Barry and Melanie, we also have case studies on Syria by Alex Bolfras, uh, Iran and Iraq by Ken Pollack, the Balkans by Bill Dirch, Russia by Thomas Wright, and China by Michael Chase. So uh, excellent reading that explains a lot of these case studies and again, answers some of the questions we were just talking about uh, with applicability to the most pressing Amer American national security problems going forward. So it's a very policy relevant book, extremely well researched and written. Barry and Melanie, I wanna thank you again uh, for joining us today and congratulations. Thanks very much, Mike. Thank you, Mike. So with best wishes to all and uh, enjoy the rest of your summers and we'll see you again soon. Okay. Signing off. Bye-bye. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.